Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends welcome to the class of public international law lecture 4 continuing from the last lectures the next topic that we have is international law and municipal law or we can say what is the relationship between international law and municipal law i am dr ashutosh acharya senior assistant professor Law Center 2, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We will today discuss the relationship between international law and municipal law, wherein we will try to identify that how municipal law reacts to international law. As we see the making of international law, either through treaties or international custom, we see that these international laws are to be made part of domestic legal system. This is necessary because if they are not made part of domestic legal system or municipal legal system, then states will not be in a position to implement them. The actual implementation comes into being once international law becomes part of domestic legal system. If domestic legal system fails to do so, then it has not accepted or incorporated the international law which it has accepted in the form of a treaty or as a matter of practice under international custom. So therefore, how divergent are the practices with respect to different states will also be discussed in today's class. We will primarily look at United States practice, we will look at the practice of United Kingdom and certainly in detail we will discuss the practice of India as far as implementation of international law in domestic legal system is concerned. What is the background behind acceptance towards international law as far as these countries are concerned? We need to understand that different states have different legal systems and different states have different approaches to towards acceptance of international law into their domestic legal system. And this difference of approach leads to divergent practices as far as acceptance and implementation of international law into their domestic legal system is concerned. The states try to implement international law into their domestic legal system so that they can also benefit from the growth and progression of international law. So therefore, friends, let us have the learning objectives for today's class and that would be to understand and learn interaction between international law and domestic law. Second objective is to learn the functioning to implement of international law or to learn the functioning of the implementation of international law into domestic legal system. To compare responses of different domestic legal systems to international law, to learn Indian approach to application implementation of international law. We see that there is interdependence and close knit connection between international law and domestic law. Friends, if you look at the whole regime of human rights, you will see that Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or be it International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or be it ECOSOC. All of these human rights documents that traces or their large application can be found in the domestic legal systems. The fundamental rights that we have in India mentioned in the constitution or for that matter bill of rights or for that matter fundamental rights in any other country can be seen to have been derived from these international documents. This is how we see international law coming into being in the domestic legal system. Well friends, 
international law at various areas or in various fields acts as a guiding line as a torch bearer for the framing of domestic legal system as well especially if you look at humanitarian or human rights matters also if you look at environmental matters we see that international law has played a significant torch bearer role as far as framing of in domestic legal system is concerned it also acts as a guiding principle based upon which domestic legal system can be shaped therefore there is substantial interdependence and close knit connection between international law and domestic law second municipal law governs domestic aspects third international law primarily concerns states well friends if you look at domestic legal system it imposes rights and duties upon individuals because individuals and domestic organizations are the subjects of domestic legal system whereas if you look at international law we see that largely it is the states that are the subjects of international law we will certainly delve into this topic as well in the next class wherein we will deal with subjects of international law that apart from states to what extent international organizations and individuals are also subjects of international law but for today let us understand that states being the primary subjects of international law be it individually or be it as a member of an international organization it is the state that is supposed to take up the obligation as individual state entering into a treaty or a convention or as a body or as a part of international organization it is the state that is to take care of any obligation that is created being a member of that particular international organization so therefore international law primarily concerns states and it is upon the states and incumbent upon the states to implement international law into domestic legal system especially the ones that are accepted or that have been accepted or that have been consented to by the state apart from that there are certain international laws which are of highest importance which may be peremptory norm of international law that is torture should not be allowed in a particular state genocide should not be allowed in a particular state in such scenarios it is automatically even without signing a treaty even without consenting in a particular document or at a particular forum or being a member of an organization irrespective of any of such scenarios states are bound to implement such international laws into domestic legal system and protect its individuals in general from such grave breaches or crimes that may occur so there are different types of duties that a state bears and it is a state's responsibility to implement those duties it is the general obligation to act in conformity with the rules of international law so be it an international custom or customary rule of international law or international treaty it is the general obligation of the state to act in conformity with the international law if it fails to act in conformity with international law especially in situations where it has accepted or consented to an international legal position then the state can face a state responsibility as well next binding nature of security council resolution apart from accepting certain obligations in the form of a treaty provision or in the form of international custom or customary rule of international law or use cogens there is another area under which a state is bound to accept international law and that is through security council resolution security council being one of the important organ of united nation can be considered to be not only the prime executive body of international system mandated under united nations organization but can also be considered to be acting legislatively it can legislate by passing resolution and resolutions passed by security council 
are binding in nature. Therefore, states can be held bound also when there is creation of law through Security Council resolution. The examples of this particular aspect can be taken from resolution that had been passed for Iraq, resolution number 1199, resolution number 1240 and few other resolutions. To stabilize the situation in Iraq or resolution passed for Kosovo crisis or resolution passed for recent humanitarian aid to be provided in Gaza. So, when such resolutions are passed, states are obligated to allow the implementation of such resolution. So, this is how also we see implementation of international law in domestic legal system. Widening of jurisdiction, another important aspect that we can notice or that we have noticed in the contemporary times is the European Union formation. Now, what does this signify? If we look at European Union, we will see that European Union is a regional organization, also an international organization and here we see widening of jurisdiction as we can note that there is European Court of Human Rights, European Commission and other European bodies that have the supervening authorities over the state. So, there is transaction or there is apparency as far as states are concerned. The aspect of sovereignty gets diluted to a certain extent as far as European Union rules and regulations are concerned. So, European Un Union has a significant supervening power and authority in certain matters as far as states are concerned. So, the territoriality or the aspect of territoriality can be said to be have been diluted as far as European Union rules and regulations are concerned. In such a scenario, we can note that how international law gets directly implemented in the domestic legal system. When European Union makes any change or introduces any particular law, then the European Union state or a member state is then bound to accept that particular law. Therefore, it is one of the perfect example and we do not have any, any other example similar to that of European Union. So, I would say it is one of the perfect example where we see flexible implementation of international law into domestic legal system, especially in the matters of human rights and humanitarian matters. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that when a rule of international law is brought before domestic court and the rule is not part of domestic legal system. Now, this is the problem that we will address or we are trying to address as far as this particular topic is concerned. Now, let us start from the basic concept that is theoretical background of the whole topic that is international law and municipal law relationship. There are two theories which define this particular relationship that is the implementation of international law into domestic legal system. First one being dualism and the second one is monism. There is third theory also which finds space between these two theories. So, the two extreme theories that we have is that of dualism and monism. This the, the theory that finds a space between these two theories is the theory of harmonization. Now, dualistic theory or dualism says or stresses upon the importance of the state and tends to regard international law as founded upon consent of states. Now, friends, let me tell you that this particular theory is the genesis or can find its trace from dualistic state. The first or the prime dualistic state is United Kingdom. It is extreme to the extent that even if it has developed its own custom and other states have followed that custom 
or practice based on international transaction or any practice which is of international character. Then in such a scenario, we see that even then the internal law or the domestic legal system fails to accept international legal position. We will discuss this in detail in the next or upcoming slides. But the point that we must note here is that dualist states believe that any international law cannot become the part of domestic legal system unless and until it has been accepted specifically expressly by the domestic legal system. This is the approach that positivist school of thought has also taken to a larger extent. Not all positivists but majority of them believe that unless and until there is codification, unless and until there is proper express acceptance by the domestic legal system, no international rule or no international law can become the part of domestic legal system. And therefore, it says positivism stresses upon the importance of the state and tends to regard international law as founded upon the consent of the states. It believes in existence of wide differences between the two functioning bodies. Friends, it is a very important point to be noted here that as it says that these are two different systems and rightly so said and we must also not compare the two systems. International legal system functions on different premises. The basic premise upon which international law functions is consent unless and until a state consents we cannot say that the state is bound by a certain international legal obligation or a provision. However, if you look at domestic legal system, consent from the subject is not required. In domestic legal system, individuals being the subjects, permission or consent is not required. Whereas, in international legal system, any obligation except few obligations or certain obligations unless and until consent is given by the state, the international law cannot be enforced or imposed against that particular state. And therefore, based on these particular basic differences, the structure and the formation of these two legal systems are completely different. And therefore, we say that since they are different in nature and formation, therefore, there should not be a direct implementation of international law into domestic legal system. Unless and until there is internal consent, the international law should not be implemented in the domestic legal system. That is what dualists believe and as the word signifies, dualism means coming, that is you have to do two times dual and therefore, once for first time you have to accept an international obligation at international fora and at the second time you have to accept internally. Unless and until these two steps are followed, international law does not become part of domestic legal system. Here we see supremacy of a state, a state being the supreme, a state being the sovereign. It does not allow international law to dilute the idea of sovereignty. If you compare to the just uh, two minutes before the example that we took of European Union, if you look at European Union, as I said, the construction of European Union is such that the effect of laws of European Union is such that it dilutes sovereignty and territoriality to a certain extent. However, if the states are following dualist approach, then unless and until internal law accepts international law, the international law will not become part of the domestic legal system. And therefore, this shows that there is supremacy of a state. It does not want to allow dilution of territoriality or dilution of sovereignty or sovereign related aspects. It wants to keep intact the sovereign aspects. The second theory based upon which international law may be or can be implemented or can be seen to have been implemented in states is monism. Mono, monism comes from the word mono that is single, that once you accept international obligation or international law, it can become part of domestic legal system. Advocates supremacy of international law, especially in areas of human rights. So, 
states or jurists or proponents of this particular theory believe in the supremacy of international law, not in all matters, but yes, especially in the matters of human rights, that where there is international law pertaining to human rights, for example, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, International Covenant on Economic, Cultural and Social Rights. These international covenants, conventions, declarations should directly become part of domestic legal system and courts of those legal system must be in a position to use those conventions, covenants or declarations in order to secure the rights of individual, in order to secure individual liberty and freedoms of the people. So, if the domestic legal system has yet so far not recognized any aspect of liberty or freedom mentioned in the domestic legal, mentioned in the international legal system, then courts can directly take help of the international legal system in order to secure the rights of its own nationals or citizens. Since states owe their legal relations to each other, to the rules of international law, there is uniformity. It was said by Kelsen, international law are basic in character with respect to jurisdiction, sovereignty and equality of states. Between these two extreme theories, dualism and monism is the third theory, is the theory of harmonization and it says wherever there is domestic law available, it will be applied otherwise international law can be given space in domestic legal system. So, it simply says that if for a particular subject matter there is presence of domestic legal system, preference must be given to domestic legal system. However, where there is absence of domestic legal system or domestic law, then in such a scenario remedy or justice can be delivered by using international law. So, that is a middle way which is theory of harmonization which avoids taking any extreme sides. Theories of application of international law within municipal sphere, specific adoption or specific incorporation theory. The positivists are of the opinion that customary international law cannot directly be applied within the municipal sphere by state courts. To be applied in municipal sphere, it is essential for international law to undergo a process of specific adoption or specific incorporation into municipal law, which is similar, almost similar to dualistic approach. Transformation theory, as long as international law consisting of treaties is concerned, there must be a transformation of the treaty provisions into municipal law. The transformation of treaty provisions into municipal law is not merely a formal requirement, but a substantive one. Delegation theory, the critics of transformation theory put forward a theory of their own. According to delegation theory, there is delegated to each state constitution by constitutional rules of international law the right to determine when the provisions of a treaty are to come into force and manner in which they are to be embedded in municipal law. Now, apart from these theories and conceptual background, let us now look at the actual examples of states and how different states apply these theories in order to implement international law in domestic legal system. We will first discuss international law before municipal court of UK. So, we will take the, take the case of UK and then we will take the case of United States of America and then certainly in detail we will discuss U India as well. We will discuss the customary practices of UK, US and India and at the same time we will also discuss the treaty implementation practice of UK, US and India, how international customs get implemented in UK. The basic policy of UK, be it a treaty or international custom, is to give effect to clearly established rules of international law. So, the primary policy is not to avoid international law, but to give effect to international law. However, since it is a dualist state, it has a procedural step 
that is to be fulfilled and that procedural step as I told you earlier also is that it must be accepted in the internal law as well. Now, what is the process? We will come to it in the next slide. Now, let me give you a legal position through case law through which we learn or which exemplifies that what is the legal position of United Kingdom as far as implementation of international custom in domestic legal system is concerned. So, the important case that we have before us is R versus Kane 1876. The facts of the case are the German ship Franconia collided with and sank a British vessel in English Channel within 3 miles of the English coast. German captain was indicted for manslaughter. Now, friends, let me give you a little background of this particular factual scenario. Now, we are talking about 19th century 1876. Now, at that point of time, we see that United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea was far, far away, 100 years away, more than 100 years away. So, there was no uniform law in the form of a convention or a codified law. In fact, there was divergence in practice. In fact, I would say the law with respect to jurisdiction over sea was in a nascent stage. However, states, especially European states, very much concerned about their security, had started the practice of exercising jurisdiction in the waters or sea waters attached to their coastline so that they can take care of their ports, so that they can take care of their territory so that their peace and security or order is not prejudicially affected by the acts of other state. It is the time when states can resort to warfare in order to expand their territory and sea route is considered or was considered and is also considered to be one of the best method to enter into the territory of another state. Sea route can be considered to be a silent approach and reach towards expansionism or towards aggression into any other state. And therefore, jurisdiction was getting adopted by certain European states. Now, once you accept that there will be jurisdiction, once these states accepted that there will be jurisdiction in the waters attached to their coastline, what will be the extent of that jurisdiction? Now, let me tell you friends that UK had gone over with certain practices. The practices that it had already adopted were cannon shot rule, eyesight rule, but later on it came to a finalization of measurement and that measurement that it did was of 3 miles. That 3 miles starting from the coastline would be treated as territory of the UK, land territory of the UK. That means, all the laws that are implemented in the territory of the UK will be applicable in the territory which is covered by sea water. So, sea water was not assumed to be a land territory, is not considered to be a land territory. However, for the purpose of application of law, for legal fiction or by application of legal fiction, it will be considered as land territory and up to 3 nautical miles or in 1876, 3 miles, we can say that UK was exercising the practice of territorial jurisdiction up to 3 miles. So, now what does this mean or you can say what are the implications of such practice getting adopted by the authorities? of UK or executive authorities of UK or law enforcing agencies of UK. This means that if any crime happens within 3 miles of the coastline of UK, the jurisdiction will be that of the court of United Kingdom. Now, that is the effect that it will entail. At the same time, we have another legal position or another legal practice that is in place and that is flag state jurisdiction, which means that anything that happens or if any wrongful act or if any crime happens on the sea, the jurisdiction will not be that of nearest 
coastal state whereas the jurisdiction will be that of the state where the ship is registered or to which the ship belongs to. So, if the ship is bearing the flag of France, Norway, Netherlands, Denmark, etc., it will have the jurisdiction of respective state and not the state near to which it is sailing. So, flag state jurisdiction comes in contradiction with the territorial jurisdiction getting implemented in sea water and that is why this case here as we know the facts that German ship Franconia collided with and sank a British vessel in English channel within 3 miles of the English coast German captain was indicted for manslaughter. Now, issue is whether an English court have jurisdiction to try the offence in such circumstances because flag state jurisdiction will deny jurisdiction of English court. So, the question of jurisdiction was raised before the English court and as we see that court decided the English court does not have jurisdiction since there is no legislation endowing jurisdiction upon the court as a result German captain was released. Now, why did court say that English court does not have jurisdiction? The court decided on the basis of the fact that since England is a dualist state and any international practice which is prevalent or which is carried out by UK or any other state or states, it must be part and parcel of domestic legal system. The court is not concerned with creation of law, the court is concerned with implementation or enforcement of law. The court is to adjudicate upon the law that has been passed by the parliament. And since English parliament has not passed any law with respect to such international practice, where the English executive authorities claimed that it is the other states that have incorporated similar or same practice copying from English practice. So, we are the pioneers of starting this particular practice of having territorial jurisdiction up to 3 miles and other states are following it. Therefore, it is international custom and Germany must be bound by it. However, court refused as we see that since UK is a dualist state, English court did not divul divulge it into diverging from the practice that it has accepted and the practice is of dualism. That is, unless and until there is a legislation passed by the parliament, we cannot say that it is the law of the land. Later, we see that in 1878, Territorial Waters Jurisdiction Act was passed expressing British jurisdiction rights in similar circumstances. Another case that we see is that of Mortensen versus Peters, the, where the Danish captain was convicted by Scottish court for contravening a fishing bylaw regarding Moreforth beyond 3 miles. The Act of Parliament since was in existence. Therefore, there was no problem as far as implementation of the international law being part of the domestic legal system was concerned. Another case that we have is of 1939, Shungshi Shuang versus R. Lord Atkin had said, international law has no validity except in so far as its principles are accepted and adopted by domestic law. In practice, international law is now not treated as a foreign law but in an evidential manner as part of law of the land. The rule of stare decisis applicable in domestic legal system and not applicable in international legal system. Further, the later changes with the changing times the, unlike the former since why do I say so that things have changed is because in human rights matter now we see a divergent practice as far as UK is concerned. You need not have necessarily a legislation especially for the implementation of human rights. Next is what happens if a treaty is signed by United Kingdom representative and it is to be implemented in domestic legal system. Well, friends, it will not be implemented in England or United Kingdom unless and until a particular rule is followed or the process mentioned in the rule is followed. And what is that rule? That rule is known as Ponsonby rule and it says the text of any agreement which means international agreement, the text of any international agreement requiring ratification, acceptance, approval or accession has to be laid before parliament at least 21 sitting days before any action is taken. 
So, we see that before parliament approves of any particular international agreement, it cannot become part of the domestic legal system. What is the position of United States as far as implementation of international law and domestic legal system is concerned? As far as international custom is concerned, the position is similar to what we see in UK, that is of dualism. However, due to certain difference in approach with respect to treaties, some jurists argue that US can be considered to be an example of a monist state that once it signs an international treaty or accepts any international agreement, agreements obligations, then it can be implemented in domestic legal system. So, if you look at implementation of international treaties in United States, it bifurcates the treaties into two headings. It underlines that at the outset there are two types of treaties, self-executing treaties and non-self-executing treaties. Self-executing treaties are implemented automatically. The treaty should not have involved political question. Example, treaties affecting rights and duties of private citizens. So, how do you bifurcate a treaty whether it is self-executing or non-self-executing? So, the bifurcation is based on the subject matter. If the subject matter affects private rights or rights of private citizens and not public at large, then that particular treaty would be self-executing treaty. Whereas, a treaty that is signed by United States of America or representatives of the US, if it is of public nature, it affects public at large and not the private rights then it falls within the domain of non-self-executing treaties and it requires enabling acts or you can say the domestic law has to approve of it and unless and until it is approved, it does not become part of domestic legal system. So, let us understand this by an example of case. Sui Fuji versus California, case of 1952. Japanese citizen purchased some land in 1943 in California. The state came up with a legislation barring or dispossessing aliens from having any right to acquire land. The claimant here argued that it is in violation of United Nations Charter since the law is violation of human rights based on racial discrimination. And as we see United Nations Charter seeks to protect any type of racial discrimination happening around the globe. And therefore, the issue whether United Nations Charter is self-executing treaty. Answer to this would lie in our previous discussion and that is what is a self-executing treaty? The bifurcation again is based on private and public rights and obligations. So, whether United Nations Charter endows public rights or endows private rights, whether it takes care of public aspects or takes care of private aspects. The court decided that the United Nations Charter laid down various principles and objectives of the United Nations organization, but do not purport to create rights of private persons. Therefore, legislative action is required as far as implementation or a specific implementation of United Nations Charter is concerned. So, United Nations Charter is a non-self-executing treaty. So, we see with respect to treaties in United States, such as the bifurcation and it has monist approach only in the matters wherever there will be a treaty which takes care of private rights or private matters of individuals. Next is implementation of international law in India. India at the outset is a dualist state that is since it is a member of commonwealth countries and it has largely accepted common law system. The approach primarily is that of dualism. There are certain constitutional provisions that allow the implementation of international law into domestic legal system. So, therefore, we cannot 
peripherally say that international law will automatically become part of domestic legal system. So, these provisions facilitate the coming into acceptance of international law into the domestic legal system. So, there are provision which entails responsibility upon the Indian government or a state to respect and foster international law and at the same time provides for procedural requirement and provides for a procedure through which international law can be implemented in domestic legal system. Well, friends, the procedure is not something different from implementation of any other law. The procedure is same. However, the same procedure with this guiding line of fostering and respecting international law can be read to understand the implementation of international law in domestic legal system, be it international custom or be it international treaty or a convention. The same process is applicable as far as making any international law part of domestic legal system is concerned. Article 51 says, the state shall endeavor to promote international peace and security, maintain just and honorable relations between nations, foster respect for international law and treaty obligations in the dealings of organized peoples with one another and encourage settlement of international disputes by arbitration. Article 73 says or talks about extent of executive power of the union. So, if you look at article 51, it forms part of directive principles of state policy and acts as a guideline for the state to promote, maintain, foster, encourage international law. And if any international law is to be implemented or if any international obligation is to be accepted, we have certain other provisions which facilitates the acceptance of international law. Article 73 for that matter provides for executive power of the union. Now, 73 in general provides for extent of executive power of the union. However, the same can be used as far as the implementation of international law is concerned. We see that clause 1 says, subject to the provisions of this constitution, the executive power of the union shall extend clause A to the matters with respect to which parliament has power to make the laws and clause B to the exercise of such rights, authority and jurisdiction as are exercisable by the government of India by virtue of any treaty or agreement. I repeat to exercise of such rights, authority and jurisdiction as are exercisable by the government of India by virtue of any treaty or agreement provided that the executive power referred to in sub clause A shall not save as expressly provided in this constitution or in any law made by parliament extend in any state to matters with respect to which legislature of the state has also power to make laws. Now, friends here it is pointing us towards the separation of powers with respect to union and a state. So, schedule 7 divides the areas towards which center can make law or union can make law and where the state can make law or where both the state as well as union can make law. So, there is union list, state list and concurrent list. So, wherever state can make law, union is not to interfere. But as far as treaty or international agreements are concerned, it is absolutely within the power of the union to sign a treaty or international agreement and make law with respect to that particular international treaty or agreement. Article 246 and 253 read with entry 14 of list 1 of the 7th schedule of the constitution of India. Article 246 says notwithstanding anything in clauses 2 and 3, parliament has exclusive power to make laws with respect to any of the matters enumerated in list 1 in 7th schedule in this constitution referred to as the union list. Now, friends, let me point out here that list 1 that is the 
union list has certain entries and entry 14 of that particular list specifically mentions international agreements or treaties. So, it is the subject matter of the union or the center to make any law with respect to international agreement or treaty. Article 253 says legislation for giving effect to international agreements. Notwithstanding anything in the foregoing provisions of this chapter, parliament has power to make any law for the whole or any part of the territory of India for implementing any treaty, agreement or convention with any other country or countries or any decision made at any international conference association or other body. So, a cumulative reading of article 51, article 73, 246 and 253 along with entry 14 of list 1, we see that constitution has provided for provisions which facilitates entry of international law into the domestic legal system. So, these are the constitutional provisions through which we see entry of international law. But at the same time, we have seen at many instances that where legislation is not there or there is absence of legislation with respect to implementation of international law or whether international law requires to be implemented in domestic legal system. Such questions have come before the court. Therefore, in such scenario, we have seen court taking approaches or steps which are pioneering in its own form and content. The judiciary of this country in the last 70 to 75 years have taken a very divergent approach from a strict application of dualism. Wherever it has found the necessity of recognizing international law or taking help of international law, in the cases where there is absence of legislation, then we see a little divergence from a strict approach of dualism. We will understand this particular aspect through different cases. One of the interesting case or initial cases that we have with respect to implementation of international law and domestic legal system is in Re Berubari Union and exchange of enclaves. Now, here the background is that after India got free, the Red Cliff line was to be implemented. That is the East and West Pakistan was to be formed, certain territories were to be handed over to Pakistan, certain territories were to be handed over to India because it was such a huge boundary that exact application and implementation of the boundary distribution had not happened. So, in certain areas, especially in West Bengal area, the implementation was still happening. Since the countries were still coming out of the effect or tragedy of the part partition, we see that post partition after 10 years or so, India and Pakistan entered into an international agreement so that the settlement with respect to boundaries can be done. And as a result, the governments of both these states at that point of time mutually agreed to hand over those villages, territories which actually belong to Pakistan and territories which actually belong to India. It was a mutual exchange of enclaves and territories in 1956 to 1960s. An international agreement was also signed that is to implement the exchange of territories. However, this was questioned that can merely by signing an international agreement exchange of territories can happen because by that time already constitution was in place and as per constitution if any territory is to be ceded or a secession has to take place, change in the boundary has to take place, it must be done by the act of parliament. And if you look at article 1 and article 3, we, use, we will notice that if you look at article 3 and 1, we will notice it talks about formation of new states and alteration of areas, boundaries or the names of existing states. It says parliament may by law form a new state by separation of territory 
from any state or by uniting two or more states or parts of states or by uniting any territory to a part of any state. Was B, increase the area of any state, diminish the area of any state, alter the boundaries of any state, alter the name of any state, provided that no bill for the purpose shall be introduced in either house of parliament except on the recommendation of the president and unless where the proposal contained in the bill affects the area, boundaries or name of any of the states. The bill has been referred by the president to the legislature of that state for expressing its views thereon within such period as may be specified in the reference or within such further period as the president may allow and the period so specified or allowed has expired. And therefore, due to this particular provision, president referred this particular matter to seek an advisory opinion from the Supreme Court of India. So, under its advisory opinion, the question before the court was whether the secession of Berubari to Pakistan as per a boundary commission's award could be implemented through parliamentary legislation or required an amendment to the Indian constitution under article 368. Further, article 1 says in an answer to this particular issue, name and territory of the union. India that is Bharat shall be union of states, states and the territories thereof shall be as specified in the first schedule. So, the territory and the parts of the country are specified in the first schedule. So, if any change happens, amendment, whether amendment is required in the first schedule, whether amendment is required through article 368. So, such is the question where secession of Beribari Union to or areas of certain Berubari Union are uh, to be given to Pakistan is concerned. The territory of India shall comprise the territories of the states, the union territories is specified in the first schedule and such other territories as may be acquired. The court gave in its advisory opinion said, yes, the amendment is required. Since India is a dualist state, an amendment, a constitutional amendment is now required in order to implement international agreement. A similar case erupted from the same issue and is known as Ram Kishore Sen versus Union of India, where the claim is with respect to the transfer of Berubari Union number 12 and village of Chilahati to Pakistan. And it is claimed by Ram Kishore Sen that this particular transfer is illegal. That is, the claim is based on the argument that since independence, the people living in those areas are belonging to West Bengal, they have cultivated lands in those areas, they have been residing there for more than one decade or two decades, or near to two decades, they should not be moved. Another argument that they it was that was raised by Ram Kishore Sain was based on adverse possession that since the residing of the people of that particular area is, is more than 10 years and 15 years or more than 20 years for so many years people have been residing in that particular area. The claim on the basis of adverse possession has come into being since no objection was raised as far as India's possession over that particular territory is concerned. Another case that we see is of Wellore Citizens Welfare Forum versus Union of India. Now friends, with respect to environmental matters, we see a number of cases decided by the Supreme Court wherein it has upheld the recognition of international law to be part of domestic legal system or you can say it has implemented international law into domestic legal system. If you look at the facts of the case, a petition was filed or you can say public interest litigation was filed under article 32 of the constitution of India, wherein it was filed by Wellore Citizens Welfare Forum and is directed against the pollution which is being caused by enormous discharge of untreated effluent by the tanneries and other industries in the state of Tamil Nadu. It is stated that the tanneries are discharging untreated effluent into agricultural fields, roadside, waterways and open lands. The untreated effluent is finally discharged in river Palar, which is the main source of water supply to the residents of the area. According to the petitioner, the entire surface 
and subsoil water of river Palar has been polluted resulting in non-availability of potable water to the residents of the area. It is stated that the tanneries in the state of Tamil Nadu have caused environmental degradation in the area according to the preliminary survey made by the Tamil Nadu Agricultural University Research Centre Vellore, nearly 35,000 hectares of agricultural land in the tanneries belt has become either partially or totally unfit for cultivation. It has been further stated in the petition that the tanneries use about 170 types of chemicals in the chrome tanning processes. So we see that how grave is the matter as far as this particular case is concerned. Whereas there was lack of legislation, there was lack of law in the domestic legal system, court took help from Stockholm Declaration 1972, it pointed out the WCED report, Our Common Future, which was chaired by Prime Minister of Norway, Ms. G. H. Brundtland, which is also known as Brundtland Report. 1992 Rio Declaration, all of these point towards certain principle, that is sustainable development principle, that if any development is to take place or if any developmental activity is to take place, it must be sustainable and it must be based on polluter based principle, it must be based on precautionary principle that it is the duty of the state to ensure that certain precautions with respect to environmental matters have been taken so that environmental degradation is not happening, environment can be protected and there is sustainable development or if any pollution is done which is environmental harming then that particular individual legal personality must be held responsible, must pay for the pollution that it has made. Another case can be Jolly George Vogues versus Bank of Cochin, where we see that section 51 clause C of the civil procedure code was challenged which allows for detention if a particular person fails to pay his or her debt. Whereas article 11 of ICCPR makes it clear that no person should be detained merely because he or she has failed to discharge his financial obligations. So court here took a very liberal approach as far as article 11 of ICCPR's implementation is concerned and as far as detention of a person due to non-availability of funds are concerned. Another case that we may take here is Vishakha versus the state of Rajasthan. Here we see implementation of Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Court took help of Article 14, 15, 21 and 253 of the Constitution and laid down guidelines which were borrowed from CEDAW. And these guidelines included duty of employer, definition of sexual harassment, prevention, preventive steps to be taken in the matters of sexual harassment, criminal proceedings to be taken, disciplinary action, complaint mechanism, complaints committee to be formed, workers initiative and awareness with respect to sexual harassment. Vishakha versus state of Rajasthan is a landmark judgment as far as prevention of sexual harassment at workplaces is concerned. And therefore, we see through these cases which where human rights are recognized wherein we see environmental protection gets recognized, we see there was absence of legislation, even then judiciary of India has recognized international law, has taken help of international law in order to implement the same in domestic legal system. So therefore, we have seen in certain matters, we see direct entry of international law in domestic legal system, but largely India requires Parliament's action as far as implementation of domestic, implementation of international law in domestic legal system is concerned. With this, I would end the today lecture number four, that is international and municipal law. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Namaskar.